Bud Light's marketing gaffe still lingers. This is The Focus Group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, Mr. John T. Nash. We are the Wednesday Focus Group. I guess, I guess when, I don't know what I would call it. Are we a show? We're still a show. Yes, yes we're still a show. In our you 15th always, year or 16th year? You, you got it revert. It's it's Tuesday is the podcast, podcast. of the Wednesday. So the yeah. Wednesday show. Maybe we should call it all, it's all kind of the same thing. Well, they're all podcasts, right? Right. Every, well, I guess so. Well, this is a video cast. So if you're watching, yeah. you can see us uh, in the live flesh in our home studios. And uh, you can go to focusgroupradio.com and click on uh any of the uh media that we have there and download and take it with you or just listen right there stream it uh onto your favorite device be sure to follow us if uh on your platform of choice you'll also see our sponsors there including critics choice video who've been with us here for quite some time and we'll talk about them a little later in the show and a new release that they have john before the um before we started recording you would mention connections it's almost as yeah. if you read my mind because i was going to ask you whether it's from the New York Times, the connections, which I some days I get it, boom, boom, boom. Other days, like today, for instance, I did not get it. I haven't played today. But I did. I was very upset because I had quite a streak with Wordle. Do you mm. do Wordle too? Yes. So here's the sequence. We do Wordle, connections, the mini, the crossword puzzle. What's the mini? mini? Oh, I didn't the know mini, that. It's a mini crossword puzzle. I do spelling. Have you done the spelling? Oh, try the spelling one i'm some days i get it some days it's way off for me yeah well the uh, same with connection but wordle i was upset because somebody a friend of ours from high school heather had posted that she got it within two words oh that's so, happened to me uh, it's happened to it. me once yeah it's some my my start word do you, what's your start word i use the word slate s-l-a-t-e i use night which is n-i-g-h-t yeah and I have this, I have this pro pro progression that I use, the three same three words every time, and I usually get it either by the third or the fourth one. So I, I do night, and then I do a rose, A-R-O-S-E, and then I do lucky. Or I'll do mucky, because uh, it pretty much does most of the letters by then, and then I can jumble them around. So when I saw that Heather got this thing in two words, I thought, well, it's not going to be night, because I, you know, night's been before. So I changed my... Star pattern word. and I, I did different words and ended up losing all my yeah. <laughs> i was so upset i'm now down your to streak, zero you, you broke my streak, streak is zero i was I, I, do you what's so your streak? I don't do you have a streak <clears throat> yeah if you I forget a, it one day it goes away and i've some days i have a I streak of like it. 12 days and then i missed a word and it was gone um bob had a huge streak that he was so jealous of i remember one time he woke himself up at 11 45 to oh try God. to get the word yeah i was like Stop. this is insane are you laughing so did you, you could probably Google this, but the New York Times actually published an interesting article about the Wordle statistics. And so, you know, obviously there's, they have statistics right. about this. And a lot of people used to use the word adieu as their start word because right. it had all the vowels, A-D-I-E. -E. Right. So it turns out though, that the best word to start the game with, according to their statistics, and the one that yields an answer within three or four guesses is the word slate. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, so I had a run where I would start with slate. Sometimes I got the word on the second try. Because if you get like f three or four letters, right. it's, you know. But then I've had a couple bum days where like I'll get the uh, the T and the E. And they might not be in the right spot. And then suddenly you're kind of... <laughs> you know, I was just... I had a, 90, I had a 96 or 98 streak. And uh, so I wanted to did, keep it going. I was like, Bob, I, I did actually one time get up at 1130, said, oh my God, <laughs> I forgot. Because some days I forget to do it and then your streak is, you know, you yeah, lose your streak, you know, obviously. It's a game. Which, it's a ga it, it, that's how I need to look at it. It's a game. But I was very upset this morning when I lost. I the lost to the word sense. S-E-N-S-E. -E. Yeah. Because well, it was two, word du was, yeah, two, two duplicated S's. letters, you yeah. know, the S and the E. And it was just that I couldn't. And I started with slate. So all I got was the E, right? 
Did I get that right? So, yeah. yeah. And then uh, I got the E, but it was only in the last spot. Like if you don't get the letter in the right spot, it doesn't tell you that the letter appears twice. No. So I remember no. when I got to number six, it said, oh, sorry, the word is sense. I'm like, God damn. Well, this word I missed on was image. That was yesterday's word. Yeah, I missed on that. So that was a hard on. one because I had the A-G-E, like I couldn't, but I, I struggled to figure out what the first, and then finally I hit on, what if it starts with I, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, it could be image? Did you get it right? <laughs> I had I done, had I started with night, and then my arose, I think I would have gotten it. But so I was, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go off. I'm still using night, but I might try slate. I don't know. I have my own little little game that worked for me, but we'll see. So. <laughs> Bob, so thinks that slate, Bob thinks that when I use the word slate, I'm cheating. Why? And I had to explain to him one. that it, yeah. he said, he goes, well, that's cheating. I said, no. I said, the New York Times itself sim simply said that that that's word yielded the answer quicker than most because of the letter combination. What's Bob's start but, word? He he does a different word. He does a do sometimes. He's tried slate. He feels dirty using slate for some reason. So I don't know if he does. I haven't tried to use night. <laughs> N I I'm gonna you know I might try N -I -G -H -T. that today. When I head downtown on the train later for a meeting, I'm gonna try night because that's when I do it when I'm on the train. So my streaks never last because if I don't commute or do something, I totally forget about it. Yeah. Well, okay, so I, I feel better about it now than I was all. <laughs> Not that I'm going to get a prize. But that connections, yesterday, the last one, which I don't think anybody got, was the names of animals backwards. Ugh. Right? So they had, like, I was joking with Tim because they had kitten, stiletto, Cuban, and wedge, and that turned out to be heels, types of heels. And then I forget the other two. Then the fourth one kind of solves itself if you get the first three. And I remember hitting it and it says, oh, it's these it's the animal names backwards. And I'm like, who would ever even imagine that? A little yeah. cheaty, I think. You no, know, there, there are some that are a little bit uh, yeah. wonky. Yeah. Which uh, no, I'd, I'd agree with you on that. So uh, what caught your eye this week, Mr. Nash? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Uh, in a nutshell, what caught my eye this week was insurance fraud over in uh -oh. Ireland. <laughs> You'll love this. So uh, a woman who won a Christmas tree throwing competition in Ireland um, <laughs> lost her legal claim that she was making against an insurance company for 823000 So she's, as I said, she's from Ireland, and she... Uh, there was a photo of her in the local paper winning a Christmas tree throwing contest. Her name is Camilla Grobska. She's 36 years old. She won a 2018 tree throwing contest after she told doctors of back and neck pains. <laughs> She'd been in a car accident in 2017 that she said left her unable to work for years. So this went on for a while under the high courts and everything until the insurance company, you know, Folks, I just want to throw this out there. If you're going to try to get a million dollars off an insurance company, you better, you better make sure that you're not doing something like a Christmas tree comedy because they will investigate this, oh, right? Yeah. yeah, you better be with so, a drool cup and a scooter. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, like the Dan, yeah, the drool cup. Um, so, just days before this competition. She informed, uh, she said that to the court that the doctors had told her that constant pains in her spine, back, and neck were causing her the inability mm. to even lift her child or to play. And yet, the court was shown by the, uh, the, def the, the insurance company, they had pictures of her, this is a good one, it's, um, so they had pictures of her playing with her dog. Uh, and then, of course, um, tossing a five-foot spruce tree at the local tree throwing competition. <laughs> so the judge in the case said, um, so she was playing with her Dalmatian the whole bit. The judge says, it's a very large, natural Christmas tree. And it is being thrown by her at a very agile <laughs> movement. And so he said, I'm afraid I cannot but conclude the claims were entirely exaggerated. And then the, the court also was shown pictures of her, as I said, playing with her Dalmatian uh, in a park for about 90 minutes. And it was a, like throwing the ball, running with the dog the whole bit. So the court literally just dismissed the hearing. And now I am not sure if they're going to do this or not, but um, the insurance company could technically countersue her, right? For fraud, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm more uh, curious about this Christmas tree throwing. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Christmas no, tree no, throwing it, competition? You know, it reminded me of... I, I think I've seen pictures now and then when the Queen used to go to Scotland and they would have this Throw thing. Throw logs. They would, 
or they would throw um, like the 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 a, a mallet or a ball yeah. and chain thing, the hammer, um, or the shot, like almost like sh- it's like shot put. It's like a field and track thing, except you're tossing a Christmas tree, which if she's like had something a bad... you'd see outside of Albany, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So that that one is that's good. where that the hell did you find that? Oh, uh, I think it was Business Insider. <laughs> Oh my God, that's great! It reminds yeah. me of the time that so she 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 got caught, so her claim is now going to be dismissed. Oh God, it's totally gone. Yeah, reminds me of the time I bumped a woman, literally bumped a woman I at a stop love sign story. Yeah. when she uh, and and then she claimed when she knew I was worked at Subaru. I think she saw dollar signs, as you said, the million dollars. And so we end up going to tr- going to court. We had to have an arbitrator, and I had to get an attorney and the whole deal. And her claim was she couldn't have sex anymore with her husband, and she couldn't because uh, she had such back pain. And uh, she couldn't make the kids' beds anymore. And I looked over to my attorney. I said, "You sure it's not the cheap high heels she's wearing?" <laughs> He's like, "Don't let them. Had, don't let you them hear you go say to that. court with this." <clears throat> oh yeah, there was no damage to either car, but she had she had seen because it was a corporation, it was a company car. She had seen dollar signs, and mm-hmm. so the company had to hire me an attorney. We had to go. It was Camden County. We had to go through the whole thing, and she's clip clopping around these cheap high heels you know, way too, too inappropriate for what, you know, their age and everything else. And that's when she, she's like, well, she's claiming she can't have sex with her husband anymore because her back hurts. I was like, huh, it's probably the cheap high heels. She can't make the kids beds anymore. I said, the kids should make their own beds. But, Here's uh, the thing that I, this, all this insurance stuff, like you're going to make a claim for 800 some thousand and you're going to talk about all this stuff that, <laughs> Well, I was furious. They gave her fifteen or twelve thousand just to have her go away. Which the insurance the company paid. And I was furious. And I said to the he goes, Oh, believe me. He said, This is it's every cheaper. day. Yeah. Yeah. I said, she deserves nothing. He goes, I know she deserves nothing. I said the car yeah. wasn't no car. It was like a like parking in a parallel parking, you'd you'd bump a fender. He goes, Oh, that's that's the game. It's the way it is. She's looking for something and litigious society. We'll just move on. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what's what's a shame anymore about uh I remember anybody the first. Can sue anybody. Yeah, you know, I, I'd gone to Africa and we were in a trap. We were in Nairobi, which is you know like the fall of Jakarta every day, and uh, the cars at the traffic lights. If you didn't move, people would bump them. <laughs> and I remember all the Americans yes. that were sitting there with us started laughing. They're like, "Oh my God, can you imagine this in the U.S.? The traffic would never move. Everybody would be out exchanging their attorneys and insurance information, but they'd bump the cars, and the person that would get bumped would wave out the window and smile and laugh." <laughs> And off they go, push them out into traffic. Well, that's the way to live. Uh huh. Yeah. But, anyways, my story is uh, is quite different, um, as they as they are here with our our uh, caught my eyes. The headline is Ohio student charged with ethnic intimidation for peeing on Columbus Homes Pride flag. So there was a uh, an Ohio State student. His name was Trey Samuel Fetzer. And uh, he's 20 years old. He was a student at uh, at Ohio State, and he had uh, seen a, a in the neighborhood around the university. He had seen that a couple had a rainbow flag out on their porch. So there's a video of him on the Ring video monitor of uh, him running up there and peeing on the flag and giving the finger uh, to the camera, and then saying "F the gays, F the gays." Mm. And uh, then his little buddy down down at the bottom of the stoop is taking a picture of this video. Ha ha ha! And then they take off. This happened on February eighth in the uh, in the evening. This actually came from a listener recommended this story to us, uh, Nancy. And um, so he, they were able to find him. the The family had posted the uh, video, and somebody identified the guy right away. So he was he was arrested and charged with uh, ethnic intimidation as well as, um, let's see, homophobic remarks. They, they went through ethnic intimidation, criminal mischief, criminal trespass, and disorderly conduct. And they said that this actually could land him uh, not only some penalties in the hundreds of dollars in terms of fines, but also possible jail time. So really? what happened is after the kids did this, they decided that maybe they <laughs> realized that they were caught. Uh-huh. So they returned to the home four or five days later and knocked on the door, and they wanted to apologize so that they would drop the charges. So the uh, the kids went, they knocked on the door, the couple inside saw that it was the same kids again, and uh, they didn't answer the door or anything, they just reported it again to the police. The police asked what they were doing, they said we were coming to apologize. But the um, the family, or the, the couple in the house has not uh, dropped the charges. 
So we'll see what I, happens there. How do you feel about that? <clears throat> Not dropping the charges. Yeah, I, I'm with the fa- I'm with the I'm family. With, yeah, I, I'd keep the charges only even if it wasn't even the pride flag. Somebody's coming up and peeing on your porch. Good point, um, Tim. Good point. So for me, it's that. But it's also, you know, this used to happen in Philly a lot with, you know, the nice neighborhood Society Hill was right near the party party area, South Street. And people would pee all the time on people's plants or or go after people's, um, you know, door stoops or whatever. It's nasty. You pee in somebody's, somebody's house like that. Plus this here, too, though. He obviously did it as the flag, peeing on the flag, plus giving the finger to the camera saying, F the gays, F the gays. Yeah, so. I, agree. I I think, you know, um, years and years ago, uh, when we had our well, at our house house upstate, the only incident we ever had was kids down the road um, decide to start like yelling slurs out the window when they would drive by, and then one time we came up to the house and the <clears throat> front of the house was covered with eggs, Oof. and it was January, like they were frozen like glue on there, and my neighbor Todd got involved. I called him first and I said, "Look, I just want this to stop." Okay, so he had the the county sheriff come in, Chad Schufelt. And I remember saying, well, you know, and Chad's like, whoa, whoa. He goes, no, you did the right thing. He goes, these people walked onto your property to do this. And, and, and it's like you said about him going up to do this to the flag. It's not like they stood on the street. They came onto right. your property to do this. And the way he did that made me realize, yeah, this is not a good thing, right? Yeah. No, you need to... You need to let them know that what they did is wrong and mm-hmm. uh regardless of what it is i remember i told you this happened with uh, my neighborhood in pennsylvania where there was a a couple that moved in from massachusetts two women they put out the in june they put out the pride flag and some young teenagers kept ripping it down mm. and they could never find out who it was so the the whole street got got together and every single house put up a rainbow flag which <laughs> i thought was pretty cool but um and then it all stopped because at that point it was, you know, what's the point? They'd have to go house to house, yeah. Yeah. So, so well, two very different stories. I, I want to get. I want to do the Christmas tree throw. I, that that <laughs> intrigues me. <laughs> Make sure you have an insurance claim on file first, though, right? I know. You're fighting the company. So, as we mentioned earlier, our friends at Deep Discount have been with us here for quite some time on the focus group, and uh, they've got a site-wide sale going on right now. And uh, you can own your passion by going to focusgroupradio.com and clicking on the Deep Discount logo. And uh, during the site-wide sale, Mr. Nash, what did you find that uh, caught your eye this week? Spring site-wide sale. And if you are a listener to the audio feed, then you heard me mention on TFG Unbuttoned this week, my new show that I'm watching on TV is For All Mankind on on, on Apple TV. However, there is a movie on the Criterion Collection called For All Mankind, which I remember seeing in the theater when it came out years ago. So this was like 1989. And uh, Criterion eventually did the Criterion thing with the beautiful print, great audio, uh, wonderful um, extra features that are on the disc. But this is a movie about the, in general, about the Apollo mission, uh, the Apollo missions to the moon. So Um, I'll read the description. The gold standard for NASA documentaries, this Oscar-nominated 1989 film is rich with the alien wonder of a trip to the moon. The director, Al Reinhardt, was granted access to footage shot by astronauts during the various Apollo missions, and he and his editors cut them into an approximation of a single voyage. So he used a couple of the Apollo, like a couple of the different missions, the footage from that, to make one kind of continuous thing with a focus on moments that are eerie and awesome, with its score by the ambient music pioneers Brian Eno and Roger Eno and Daniel Lenoir, a narration provided by the original Mission Control audio recordings combined with reflective astronaut interviews such as uh, Michael Collins, Jim Lovell, Jack Swagger, and Ken Mattingly, they put together this amazing film. It's, it's, I, I just think it's a wonderful experience, and if you are a space program fan then definitely pick up For All Mankind, the Criterion Collection version on 4K and Ultra HD. I think you'll get a kick out of it. So it wasn't filmed in the Nevada desert? <laughs> yeah, Tim, I know. What you? <laughs> on a sound stage, right? Yeah. No. The, and the f- footage is a lot of this was stuff that was in the vaults. You know, they they had some really amazing. And so the there's images that you just haven't seen before. And. First of all, I'll tell you, when I saw it in the movie theater, um, I walked out and I said to my, my then roommate, Greg, uh, who went to college with me, I'm like, 
I could not do this. He, and he goes, no way, man, I'm claustrophobic. I mean, when you see they're traveling in a tin can basically. Right. So yeah. well, when you and I went to the, the uh, space, was it the space air and space uh -huh. museum down in DC? Oh, in Dallas. Yeah. I was shocked when you saw how tiny and that I, capsule I, was like, I would have never gotten that thing and said, yeah, sure. Shoot me up. <laughs> I mean, would you and seal me in for days? No, it, uh, no. Yeah. I'm with Greg. Yeah. I, 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 I would be, uh, I'd be stir crazy. Let me out. Yeah. But well, I didn't want to go in that little pod going up to the arch, St. Louis Arch. But you convinced that was on me. Jeopardy which I'm glad recently, you did. by the way. Was the, it the Saint the Saint Louis Arch was Arch was on Jeopardy, and I forget how the question was worded, or the answer was worded, um, or how you know how that is. Um, but the minute I heard it, I said, "It's the Saint Louis, the the Arch of Saint Louis." And Bob was, <laughs> "How do you know?" I said, "Tim and I were there, and I read this exact thing on one of the little <laughs> no, info yo, boards." Yeah, got to get on Jeopardy, Nash. We'll bring some oh coin. no, no, I would fail miserably. Maybe Why? not. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not as good as the Jeopardy heads. That's for sure. Well, you know, our, our friend of uh, at Subaru, my old boss, Mary Treisbach, was on Jeopardy. Oh, and, that's um, right. I remember that. She said it really comes down to how good you are with the button, because Correct. the button doesn't allow you to. So you always hear tick, 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 yep. everybody's sitting it because they're reading faster, but it doesn't allow you or it doesn't register until he's done reading. Ah, she's done reading. I did not know <laughs> that. Thank you. That's so good. it's okay. it's the luck of the tick, 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 of, of the button of, yeah. of who clicks in because she would she was frustrated. She said she knew a lot of this stuff, but it's all category luck because mm -hmm. if you don't know, like it was the Bible for me, I'd be done. I wouldn't get anything. <laughs> Mary, Jesus. All right, what'd you pick this month, this this week? Oh, yeah. So um, this actually was a recommendation from one of our listeners, Bunky, down here in Rehoboth. And uh, we were talking about different movies, and he said, did you ever see Drowning Mona? Did you know this movie? The, when you sent this over, okay, so this came out in 2000. Right. And I looked at the cast, and I thought, is this a, an attempt to recreate Throw, Mother, Throw Mama from the Train? Because that was a Danny DeVito movie as well, right? Yeah, no, this is a little different. So it's it's Bette Midler, Will Ferrell, Danny DeVito, uh, Jamie Classic Lee Curtis. Cast, yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, the premise is a woman, so it's Bette Midler. She drives her car. It, it's the town of um, Verplank, New York. Is it is it real, a real place? Mm -hmm. I think so. But apparently it's where Yugo Car Company had tested all their cars. I never knew this. So where they were doing testing in the U.S., the, the old Yugoslavian car company, Yugo. Anyway, Bette Midler's got a Yugo. It's her son's car. And uh, she's hated in town. Her name is Mona Dearly. And they said she's an abusive wife, a domineering mother, a loudmouth neighbor, a violent malcontent. And she ends up, the car she's in ends up mysteriously in the river and she's dead. She's drowned. And um, because she's so hated in the town, everyone becomes a suspect. And Danny DeVito is the police chief trying to figure out who killed Mona or who drowned Mona. So I, I looked at the reviews, and it says it's largely overlooked and forgotten, but wonderfully entertaining. A quirky movie. It's a comedy. It's dark. It's meant to be silly. It's a caricature of a small town. Don't take it too seriously, but you'll enjoy the odd characters. I love this recommendation. So. And for fifteen ninety two, it's less than two tickets to a movie. So this yeah. is right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Verplank is up on the Hudson. Yeah, okay. it's near Stony Point, so it is a real town. Yeah, the car drives on the Hudson River. This yellow Yugo, <laughs> Bette Midler's in it, and she drowns. And she's dead. Okay. Dead. So, what was the release this week? Uh, the release this, this week is Wonka. Actually, this stars Timothy Chalamet. It came out a little while ago. Um, it looks at the titular character of Willy Wonka, as created by Raoul Dahl. For obviously Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, it go it's like a prequel to that. So it's based oh. on the extraordinary character at the center of the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, and one of the best-selling children books of all time. Wonka tells the wondrous story of how the world's greatest inventor, magician, and chocolate maker became the beloved Willy Wonka we know today. This irresistibly vivid and inventive big screen spectacle will introduce audiences to a young Willy Wonka, chock full of ideas and determined to change the world one delectable bite at a time. So I was really skeptical of this when it came out because we grew up with the Gene Wilder, right? Um, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and the songs and Augustus Gloop and the Blueberry thing, like all of it, right? <laughs> I thought, why, why redo it? It's not a redo. It's a kind of a before that story. And uh, the critics liked this movie a great deal. And Timothy Chalamet apparently really knocked it out of the park. So on my list, it's twenty nine ninety nine, four K Ultra HD, right here at. Uh, 
Deep Discount. So reviewing for you folks, it's a spring site-wide sale here at Deep Discount. You can get there by going to focusgroupradio.com, clicking on the Deep Discount logo and begin your shopping experience. I recommended the Criterion Collections for All Mankind, not to be confused with the Apple TV show. This is actually documentary and it's all footage put together from the variety of the Apollo missions. Really wonderful, great soundtrack by Brian Eno and his brother and another composer <laughs> and another person. It's like Trump saying, and all my kids and that other one over there, the yeah, Eric. The um, <laughs> and here's a Tim Pick Drowning Mona, which is a comedy that takes place on the Hudson River. It's uh, with Bette Miller and a great cast. And then released this week is Wonka. And that stars Timothy Chalamet. We are going to take a really quick break. We come back. We have a deep discount. Oh, sorry. We have a business birthday and we have a shop talk. So stay with us. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now back to the focus group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. And welcome back to the focus group. It's March 6th already. Can you believe it, John? <laughs> yeah, I I had my calendar do this thing where you know you couldn't have the weeks numbered. Right. Like at the left side, it will say like, I, I don't even want to, now the number's in the double digits, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny because when I was researching our business birthday, I came across a, 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 a birthday that you had highlighted many, well, probably four, five, six years ago. It was March 6th. It was Valentina Tereshkova, which was a Soviet cosmonaut. She was the first woman in space. <clears throat> and I just looked, comrade, I looked at the picture and I laughed. Because the picture was so defiant with her stern look and the medals and the big hairdo from the, uh, from I think the 60s or 70s. Seems, yeah. And, um, and then it was accompanied with a tape of Brezhnev. Mm. And it was right out of, well, it was right out of central casting. The old Wendy's commercial, you know, evening there. They're coming into the proletariat and everybody's They're all wearing like great They got sacks. medals all the way down their ass. And, you know, sash, sashes on and then Valentina was sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> having a good time. Of course, I don't speak Russian, but I'm sure it was quite entertaining. Um, <laughs> it's the commentary. So, but that's not our business birthday today. It could, it, but I just wanted to. Perhaps we should start a, a, a Valentina Tereshkova day on the focus group or a fan page. But with, when, without when, fur- when, spring, <laughs> when spring 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 hits, <laughs> without further ado, though, yeah, everyone does celebrity birthday greetings. But the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So born today, March 6th in 1857, was a George Draper Dayton. And uh, he was uh, known best as the founder of Target department stores, as well as Dayton's, but also the Target Corporation or Target department stores. He died February 18th at 80 in uh, 1938. And uh, he was born in Clifton Springs, New York, and uh, ended up moving to Minnesota because the family figured out that it was uh, that real estate was going to be a big thing, and uh, headed out out west, and was able to buy up real estate far more uh, cost effectively than they could in the in the east. And um, he wanted to become a minister, but uh, he realized he wasn't going to make much money. Uh, being a minister, but um, so he ended up going to the business world. <laughs> That's a good call, right? <laughs> yeah, well, when you think about it, but he still had, they still had kept that, um, I guess he still had kept that uh, Christian um, uh, mindset or Christian belief in terms of doing well for others or doing, doing good for people, and, and uh, his Christian beliefs really helped form his business practices, although... I'm not so sure because he he started the Minnesota Loan and Investment Company in uh, outside of uh, Minneapolis or in Minneapolis, and the land right next to him there was a dry goods store called Goodfellow Dry Goods, and uh, they were going into bankruptcy, so he picked it up cheap. So I don't know if that's so Christian, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's dubious, Tim. It's right. dubious. So he picked the dry goods. This was 1902. The st- the store was uh, the bank foreclosed on the struggling retail store and uh, 
and uh, Dayton was able to pick it up cheap. And so it, he changed the name from Goodfellows Dry Goods to Dayton Dry Goods and uh, grew it into a major American chain of department stores, which he operated under strict Presbyterian guidelines and principles, including the stores were closed on Sundays. Uh, there was no inventory or anything done on Sundays. You couldn't even get in. Um, no repairing of anything, no cleaning. Sundays was just a, a dead day. B uh, business travel, there was no business travel on the Sabbath. Uh, never purchased advertisements or newspaper uh, ads or articles for Sunday. Also would never advertise in any uh, periodicals or magazines or anything that advertised liquor. It's pretty limiting. So uh, after his death, though, the sons took control of the company. They continued to operate the business and their father's Christian standards. But in 1950, by the time the third generation came along, they broke the tradition, secularized the place, and business boomed. <laughs> 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 they secularized the place. Yeah. There you go. So, Let's make some money, boys. Right. So that's when they said they just had launched Target in 1960, the Target department store. So one of the company's executives told the Minneapolis Tribune at the time that the goal was to combine the best of the fashion world with the best of the discount world. And that's where they came up with the idea of Target. Mm. So they wanted to operate a quality store with quality merchandise at discount prices. They said, uh, what could be immoral or shady about that? So in a certain way, they said they still had the foundational inspiration from the great grand or the grandfather, George. But at the end of the day, they decided to uh, shed some of the uh, Christian ideals. And uh, they said in 1956, he built America's first fully enclosed shopping mall. It was mm -hmm. in suburban Minneapolis. I never knew that. And uh, uh, opened a date. He'd opened up the, the uh, first discount store there called Target. And um, they also, his grandson, Bruce Dayton, also bought a struggling um, B. Dalton bookseller. Oh, boy. And um, he ended up changing, making the name B. Dalton by taking uh, the Y and making it an L. So uh, they were also the parent of that. And um, they said uh, he died of cancer in Minneapolis in 1938 at the age of 80. But yeah, that's how Target was uh, started. He was a, he owned a bank or he was a banker, and foreclosed on the uh, the land next to him, the Goodfellow Dry Goods Store, and then grew that into uh, what we know today as Target. These these um, these scions of department store fortunes, you know, yeah. Gimbel's, you could say Dayton's Gimbel's, Macy's, like they have some interesting backstories, right? Yeah, George Draper Dayton. Yeah, interesting. You know, they all seem to have. What I find in a lot of these things is the importance of taking a risk. Ah, uh, good point. You know, they've all taken risks, right? When you look yep. at any of these 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 days, when we talk about things or we we talk about different people, they 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 somewhat um, are risk takers, and there's there's certain is there certainly is a, a bit of luck. Oh well, um, you and I both know says. how much that figures into everything, right? Yeah, I was just I was reading an article about um, Mark Cuban, and they asked him what his greatest. You know, he had said he would never want to do business with himself because he was such a, an ass in his early years, because he felt he needed to be that way in business. And he said, as he got older, he realized um, that that's not the way you you treat people. They said he wasn't very good, not a good boss or whatever, and he admitted to that. But they had, they had asked him about his success, and he said, I, was, I knew the right people, and I was at the right place at the right time. And he said, it could have been somebody else. He said, but for me, he goes, and you know, a lot of that was lucky. I was lucky with who I met. I was lucky with where I was at a particular time. So, Luck, luck, luck. And, and you and I both know that luck is one of those things where it's either the ability to recognize a situation for what it is and to make a move or take right. a risk. Or sometimes it literally is a random happen chance meeting you or something happens and breaks your way. So it's, you know. Was there anything that you thought you missed out on? I know I bring up something every week that you missed, but no. <laughs> we missed that, John. We missed the socks. We missed the You this. know, I, I was recounting with a, a friend of mine the other day, my early days with my first agency, and I kind of was blandly talking about how it all wound down and what happened with the partnership and everything. And the look of shock on their face was like, you know, you could have been this, you could have, been. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like when you look at something in high, you, some, you, you, maybe you think you missed out on something or something went sideways for you, but then sometimes you look back and you're like, there was no other way. <laughs> I, I can't see, you know what I'm talking about? I, I couldn't yeah. see a different path given the personalities involved. 
and you it's a learning experience you move on so there you go yeah no there's 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 always a you know a happen chance or or you know, had you not gone to school in Bing- Binghamton, you wouldn't have met your your business partner, right? Yeah. You know, with Greg or Tim. Or even, you know, Tim, I, I think that, you know, when we were on Sirius Satellite Radio, we were brought to everybody every week by Volkswagen of America. Right. And it was an interesting set of circumstances that led us to a meeting at VW's headquarters, thanks to uh, a woman that you worked with for years who knew both of us and she knew someone. And you look at that. So sometimes things go sideways, but sometimes things just go click, click, click. And suddenly we're meeting with the CMO and then we have a contract, right? Yeah. Well, it was like the cannabis program we had when I got the call <laughs> at 1030 at night. I love from... that little, if you're not watching on video, Tim just did this like, mm, well, that went sideways too. Yeah. But well, Calling from her bed, half in the bag, smoking yeah. a joint, telling me they needed some business work, branding work. I little did we know that it. ride. You call me the next day. You're like, how do you feel about cannabis? I'm like, I have good feelings about it. What are you talking about? You're like working for it. And it went from there. But hey, that was a life preserver, right? That and it could also be if we if you and I won the lottery, I always said we would hire some writers and we would make that a Netflix series. It's so rich. Just that so is going to either be a jukebox musical, kind of in the lines. <laughs> I have a song this. list somewhere, by the way. Did you I did. Present you it to put you? together an actual <laughs> song list, and it correlates to every crazy moment of the experience we had with that client. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And you and Paul Hagen came up with the best one, the Mandy and the Jet. That was yeah, the Mandy best. and the Jet, because she had the private jet. Yeah, Mandy. which, which we all know is kind of a thing. Anyway, yes, yes, yes. So, um, our shop talk this week. Um, Sometimes I feel like this has been been beating a dead horse, but as I read this and I, and I thought with John of having a, a conversation um, overall about marketing, but the the headline is uh, Bud Light boycott likely cost Anheuser Busch, which is the holding company InBev, over a billion dollars in lost sales. So as we know, last year during um, during Pride, the uh, the marketing group at Bud Light had wanted to try to expand their their audience and um, had sent out a number of uh, solicitations to influencers, well-known influencers. I think there were over 100 or 150 influencers and with their names on a, on a can or whatever and asked them to do some, some viral or social, um, social postings. And one of them was done by Dylan Mulvaney, who's a famous trans person. And it was a very innocuous, just very well done, quite frankly, uh, influencer um, uh, piece that ended up on TikTok, but but also led to a huge boycott by uh, by the right wing and by some stars uh, such as uh, was it Kid Rock? I'm it not was, sure I would use the word star with him, but you're you're right. A singer Kid Rock, <laughs> well well known, yeah, well, former you know washed up. I don't I don't. When was the last time Kid Rock did a song that you heard in any high rotation? Right, he did the one where he stole the Alabama riff. Sweet yeah. Home, Alabama, but he, he did about Michigan. But, um, and he sung at General Motors event, so there you go. The, um, so, but, so there was a boycott. Everybody said, Let's, you got to boycott Bud Light because they've gone crazy, they've gone woke, blah, blah, blah. They've gone woke, yeah. And so they looked at, um, so they were looking at the sales for the year in 2023, and it says that uh, the world's largest brewer may have lost 1.4 billion in sales mm-hmm. because of the backlash of its brief partnership with transgender influencer uh, Dylan Mulvaney to promote Bud Light beer. And uh, they said that they think it, it hurt it, particularly in North America. And the sales declined. They lost their position as being the number one selling uh, beer beverage in the U.S. for over two decades. But then they looked at, you know, they went through and looked at the the rest of the sales across the world, and I did notice that they were also down in in most of Asia, and I yeah. thought that did that have anything to do with the boycott? I don't think so. Did it? Uh, they're they're pegging their their major losses on the boycott, and I, I think they're probably correct about that. And the but do you think um, in Asia it would have affected Asia? No, that that's just a surprise to me in general. Yeah. I wonder if that's a weird data blip that doesn't necessarily correlate to what was going on in the U.S., but it might have just been a, a shift in taste, right? Um, you know, or, or a consumption pattern that changes over time. You know, these these brands live and die on shelf space and um, case sales to bars, right? And when you have Kid Rock shooting up a bunch of Bud Light, first he bought it, so they made the money there, but then he shoots it up, which is a complete waste. 
And what Tim and I like talking about with this one is it seemed like an innocuous, innocent thing. Let's go and um, attract younger users or younger drinkers. Let's let, let's introduce them to Bud Light and the taste and the and the flavor. And let, hey, let, well, let's do uh, influencer Dylan Mulvaney, which, you know, if you're I'm, I'm just I don't mean to be insulting, but if you're in your late 20s, early 30s and you haven't seen the games and the nastiness of the far right and them latching onto anything to as a wedge issue to whip up, um, whip up the people on that side of the aisle, then you would not have even thought this was an issue, especially since they sent uh, Dylan Mulvaney one can with her right. image printed on it. And she did one innocent i mean i've watched the thing a couple times yeah, now it's 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 a know. nothing burger it's a sweet right. little um, integration and yet what it shows you is the complete change in the world that we have now which is social media is sort of like gasoline in a can right i mean now you could ignite a problem in seconds 20 years ago, you would have had to do a letter writing campaign. You would have had to provide people with sample letters to write to this nasty brand. How dare they use someone that we don't like? Now you can do it in seconds and you could walk away from it. You could like, so Kid Rock could post a video and shoot up the cans and then go about his life and not care and say, we're boycotting Bud Light. But in the end, it, it lost, people lost their jobs. Um, distributors lost revenue. So it was effective in that regard. Um, and you and I think it was a, basically a misstep that if you're going to deal with lgbtq consumers at all you got to really think the whole thing really right there's a through line well they stub their toe because they i don't care what it is if you randomly send out 100 150 solicitations you have zero control of message mm -hmm. and that was the big thing with bud light bud light was known as the frat boy you yep. know nascar brand or whatever which is fine that's their brand but you don't just willy-nilly decide well, we're we're going to change it and then you go totally off off brand and and use a trans person which you know if you wanted to go and and reach the lgbtq consumer you and i certainly would have would not have recommended that they just willy-nilly send this thing out and see what comes back because you and i have been through the loop of knowing what happens oh. particularly when you're dealing with an lgbtq consumer so you have to it has to be careful the the agency ended up getting fired but again they didn't have an agency that specialized in reaching the consumer which is important companies need to know that you and i say that all the time i think we're one of the five in the country that still does it and and uh, you'd think the phone would be ringing more well um, this is one of those cases where being uh, being our age in this space has an incredible amount of value to a company why? Because we've been doing this since the 90s. And we're talking yeah. about the, not the 1890s, Early 90s. The, the 1990s. Yeah. And, we've, and you're right, we've seen a lot of this. And I think you could have used Dylan Mulvaney, but I think it might have been in a different, like, because once you throw something on Instagram or it's, it's everybody can see it. It's, yeah. You know what I mean? It's not like, it's not located in the, in the deep seventh page of a newspaper or something like an ad would be. Um, we would have advised a slightly different approach, uh, but that's. But I can understand where it came from. I can understand that a young media buyer or a creative who yeah, yeah, everything's is wonderful. looking around at the world yeah. that seems to be changed as they were growing up, or and and the level of acceptance for this, it, it ran into a brick wall, frankly. And um, well, and, yeah, and the other toe, as you said, right? The other brand who did in the lumped together was Target when they were selling the tuck bathing suit which yeah. also happened uh, last year, which, so I thought, let me see what they've said about Target. Do you know how much they said they've lost? How much? Do you have a guess? Well, was it in the millions or no? No, it was, it was, it was a significant number. It was billions? Significant number. Like yeah. 15 billion or something? 10 billion. 10 billion? Target says they lost 10 billion due to the tuck bathing suit controversy. And... They've they talked to the CEO about it, so they're they're all, they're both trying to recover. The recovery for Bud Light has been a lot slower than they anticipated, slow, but they yeah. said that it's growing slowly. Um, Target, um, they've asked the CEO. He's doubled down. It's funny that we did the uh, the Target business birthday with the Presbyterian <laughs> ideals, but um, he had said that they did the right. Th they believe they did the right thing um, in terms of reaching and broadening the, the consumer and, and being a, a store for everybody with valued merchandise, blah, blah, blah. But um, 
not so sure again the execution was done done correctly even or relevant i mean yes you could sell a tuck bathing suit maybe that's something that does, is done online because knowing that a, a, a tiniest inch of of square footage at a department so you, you, that needs to make money for you yeah so when right. you start thinking about how many people are really buying a tucked bathing suit just some but maybe not enough to give a total floor you know huge floor space or something but you know here again is another issue where if you're laying your cards out to saying we're going to celebrate june pride and we want to um, let the lgbt consumer know we're open for business you and I would have handled it differently. And I think other companies <laughs> probably would have handled it differently from an agency standpoint that specialized in reaching this consumer, not by um, doubling down on a tuck-in bathing suit. But think about the product planning cycle. So if you're going to sell a, a tuck-friendly bathing suit, that goes back many months before yeah. Pride. So I, I just wonder about those meetings where didn't someone raise their hand and say, this is really positive, it sends a great message, Right. How many are we actually selling? Right. And if it came down to that, that decision may have been made differently. Like, you're, I don't know how many units that would have sold. I mean, we know the trans community is only 0.0001 or something percent of the population. Yeah. How many of them are actually in the market at any given time for a tuck-friendly bathing suit? If they, in fact, that's the, if it's, you know, um, female to male or male, you know, male to female transition. I, Yeah. Well, in a very simple thing, I remember I was in, I, I did a consulting thing just a, a, for a couple months with Lily Pulitzer. Yes, I remember And I that. got to sit in a meeting where they were deciding on colors for the next year, you know, trends. And the hot color that year was like this yellow, lemon yellow. And so they were doing everything in lemon yellow, and they had this line of flip-flops. And I remember the, the head merchant, and the, you know, they were our age or older, puts their hand up and says, yellow's a dog, yellow doesn't sell. No, mm. no, no, this is the trend. This is what we people want. They wanted to do these yellow flip flops, and then and the the compromise was, let's do them online. Let's not st because he said they get grimy, they don't look well after they get dirt. You know, he went through this whole thing about why yellow flip flops wouldn't work, and um, you know, similar to what you're saying about the product cycles and whatever, they decided let's let's throw that online and see how it does rather than taking up floor space or store space with it because. Um, we know that 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 product's probably not going to have the appeal of a black flip flop, for instance. And so. you probably in that meeting, you you might have even raised your hand and said, if from in the auto world, yellow and orange are two of the hardest colors to move off a lot, right? Uh, yellow, uh, orange is and and bl light blue. Light blue, okay. Light blue. Light they used blue. to call it loser blue. <laughs> if you had a light blue car, they were tough. They and they don't know why they were just seemed to be the last cars to sell. Sell, so, yeah, yeah. But uh, for no particular, well, I don't know. It's just people's choices, which is why it's funny if you watch cars on the street and you see colors. You know, yeah. it's it's silver, it's gray, it's it's white. Um, reds are tough too sometimes. Red, Maroons well, do better and, and than red. I know there was a thing about red, especially with sports cars. The cops would keep an eye yeah. out for a red sports car. Usually, it's going to travel faster. So. Yeah. yeah. So, um, just to wrap this up, the, uh, yeah, I, it, interesting. I mean, we've talked about this a little bit before, but I think that any brands that want to, as again, talk to this consumer and have a dialogue with them, I just think it does require, it's not as simple as saying, "Whoa, the level of social acceptance is way yeah. high. Let's just do this. You need Tim and John. Yeah. Well, there's nuance <laughs> to it. And also the perception is reality. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a frustrating thing for us to see this. So, but uh, yeah, so that's that. So there you go, folks. Thank you for joining us here on The Focus Group. We want to remind you to check out our partner, Deep Discount. You go to The Focus Group. Focusgroupradio.com is the site. Go there and look for the, the uh, Deep Discount logo. Click on that and start your shopping extravaganza. The uh, sale this week is a spring sale, site-wide sale. Uh, of movies that we picked, I did a Criterion Collection disc called For All Mankind. Tim, yours was? Um, Drowning Mona. Drowning Mona, which has an interesting premise. Uh, a woman drives into the Hudson River in a hated, <laughs> hated in town. She's hated in town, and everyone's a suspect because everyone had a reason to kill her. Kill her. And the uh, release this week is Wonka, starring Timothy Chalamet. It looks good. I'm going to pick it up myself. We want to remind everybody to what do we say here? Don't text and drive. Arrive alive. Stay safe, and we'll see you in the new week. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. 
Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.